welcome everyone to um, this session. Um, I'd like to introduce the first speaker um, of the session. Um, this is Calvin Higginbottom from um, PMS. Uh, Calvin has many, many years of experience in uh, die casting technology through leading die casting equipment manufacturer Oscar Fresh. Is it, have I said that right? Oscar Fresh at uh, GmbH. Calvin is now a uh, business uh, development manager at Zinc Diecast at PMS Diecasting, who is representing today. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully, everyone had a good lunch. Uh, my name's Calvin, as Vicky's pointed out. I am, I have to point out, a stupid salesman, as Simon pointed out in the last one. I am the one sitting in that chair saying, Come on, guys, make me some parts. Uh, but I have had some experience at the other end of that ladder as well, so bear with me. I'm going to give you some food for thought uh, about zinc die casting. I've heard a lot about Formula One engines and Williams Advanced Engineering and Aston Martins. Uh, I'm going to bring you back down to earth a little bit and talk about widgets. Um, this product here <coughs> um, is something we are very proud of. It is a British invention, it's a patented product, it's part of our group and we are proud members of that group and we are the producer of them and I'll give you a little bit more detail about them. You should actually be concerned about them, you should be worried about how we make them because there's lots of them hanging above your heads right now so it's much more relevant than a Formula One engine I think. So. Okay, we are a UK manufacturer, PMS Diecast team is in the UK and it's only in the UK. Um, I am a passionate manufacturer. Uh, the reason I joined PMS was to join that renaissance of UK manufacturing. Uh, but we are all probably experiencing the same challenges. So we are literally rebuilding that manufacturing base, have been now for a few years. There seems to be some momentum in that, thankfully. Nothing really changes from an economics point of view, everybody wants things cheaper, everybody wants things better, etc, etc. Um, and we, we talked about it a little bit, I think it was Vicky that talked about it this morning, the skills gap. It's very difficult to find engineers, very difficult to find tool makers, uh, and very difficult to find good ones after that, and the good ones tend to cost a lot of money. So we're all in the same boat. Um, investment is something I have to come on to because UK manufacturing has suffered a lack of investment in my opinion over the last 20, 30 years. I have lived through that, I have experienced that. I'm glad to see it has changed over the last few years. Lots of new machines coming in, lots of new furnaces coming in, lots of new technologies that we're talking about today. So, PMS, as I mentioned, uh, is a zinc die casting company. Um, we've not bothered with the headache of aluminium just yet, but maybe we'll get there soon. We produced over 70 million components last year. That's the kind of numbers we are talking about. We processed over 2,000 tonnes of zinc alloy in three different grades. That is roughly 20 to 25 percent of the complete UK zinc die casting market. So we are one of the bigger players, shall we say. We are lucky in the sense that we are part of a group. Um, the Glide group is a, an employee-owned group, so each and every employee, something maybe Vicky wants to think about for her staff retention ideas, we are all shareholders in the business. And that's important, so everybody has some sort of built-in quality requirement because it's their money that's actually making the parts. So it's in their interest to stay with the company and to build that company, me included. So, the zinc parts look very simple. I can even pass them around if you really want. They are actually load-bearing components. As I said, it's not a joke. They are hanging above your heads. The microphones up there are probably hanging on gripples and certainly the lights up here are hanging on gripples. So the quality requirements for producing such a little component are actually quite stringent. We sell roughly 80% of everything we make via our customers to the US and into Europe. And if you have an accident in the US, anybody from America, it can get very expensive. So we have to make them right. 
As well as that, we are suppliers not directly to people like Jaguar Land Rover. We supply into tier ones, so if anybody's lucky enough to drive an F-Type Jaguar, it has a piece of PMS in it. If you have a Range Rover, it has a piece of PMS in it. Um, I'm not going to tell you which piece because you'll start looking while you're driving, and that's not a good idea. Uh, but we are proud of what we do. Around roughly 10 million components is outside of the group, it's external revenue. So. I don't think I need to talk to anybody about global costs and so on and so forth. As I mentioned, 80% of our stuff goes abroad. So if we make it too expensive, we won't be making it for very much longer. It's as simple as that. So it is in our interest to keep driving those costs down. <clears throat> Just a quick look inside. We have conventional hot chamber die casting machines. They are very expensive die casting machines. They are very high technology die casting machine. I was very interested in the Ryobi presentation. All the things that you do, we actually do also. Try doing that when you're producing 70 million of them, it's not so easy. And we also use multi-slide die casting machines, which is a similar technique, just making one at a time. We're also lucky in the sense that we have our own in-house tooling division. Um, I'm going to upset the tool makers at the back of the room and tell them that this is the most advanced tool making facility in the UK. That'll make you smile. Um, it is our in house tool making facility. The benefit of that is the know how in that tool making facility. We don't just churn out lumps of steel, we actually design and build our own tools. That's the important part, that's the key part to making good parts. So, looking at the gripple. I've already shown this to Professor Campbell and he told me how wrong it was, but that's how we produce generally our gribbles. That's an eight impression shot, I have one in my hand. The reason why we have a long spidery runner that everybody's going to criticise and tell me how turbulent the flow is on the zinc etc etc, they're absolutely right, but we have sliding cores top and bottom on the components. If I have one here, I can show you. So the runner is actually going under and over the cores on the components. That's why it looks a little odd. But, having said that, we have been doing them that way for roughly 10 years, and we seem to be quite good at it. That's a picture of the, the tool design itself, and that gives you a little bit more detail about how we make them. So, imagine that coming out of a die casting machine every 10 seconds. Everyone comes out handled by a robot, Everyone then gets broken up and then sent for vibratory finishing. That's happening seven days a week, 24 hours a day, roughly 350 days per year. So, the question is, when our group of friends come along and they want a further 20% more next year, which is their predicted demand for next year, we have to have the challenge is where do we keep buying these, well, how do we keep buying more machines and where do we keep putting them? That really is a challenge. Now we are, part of our group DNA is that we stay in the UK. It would be very easy to set up a Chinese plant or an Indian plant and start bringing them in from abroad in numbers, etc. Uh, but part of our company culture, part of our employee ownership culture is actually to stay in the UK. All the group the manufacturing part of the group, injection moulding tool making, is in South Yorkshire and it will remain so for as long as I'm here anyway. Okay, so how do we get it better? Well, first of all, you have to look at how you're making it now and what are the cost factors involved. I'm going to ignore time, that's just a given. We don't have a problem with that. It's buy more machines, more capacity or do something different. It's the something different that I'm interested in, so what other costs am I going to look at? There are three from a die casting point of view, and I don't care which aluminium you, which alloy you're casting, it can be aluminium, it can be magnesium, you're going to encounter these same cost factors. The first one is the metal itself. You can't sell die castings without buying metal. That's a given. Somebody, I think it was Simon, on the last presentation talked about tool yield. If I talk about tool yield from this, it's roughly 50%. That's 50% of metal that I'm going to have to buy. 50% of the metal I'm going to have to 
melt. And then I'm going to have a calcane zinc I can recycle, but the cost of that alone is quite significant. I can tell you that's a big lump off the bottom line of PMS die casting. Okay, oxide losses are a big problem also when I start recycling a lot of melt, especially in zinc. Zinc is recyclable, it's quite user friendly, it's quite easy to cast. Uh, please don't tell that to our operators and setters. They hate the stuff. Uh, but every time I throw it back in the pot and remelt it, I am going to lose roughly 5-6% of it. That is a cost that I'm not going to recover, and it's a cost I've never really been able to recover from a customer. They don't really understand it, they don't want to know about it, it's your problem. So, we have to deal with it. The bottom one is the one I really want to talk about. I was quite interested in Professor Campbell's entertaining discussion this morning, he's always a good laugh, but he's absolutely right. If you put air inside a turbulent uh, flow, if you imagine a bath sat, this is the way I always used to describe it in my conferences before, if you put your bubble bath in a hot bath and you turn on the tap really aggressively, you get a nice frothy bath. It's the same with casting. The faster you throw in that metal, the more bubbles you're going to get in there, the more porosity you're going to get in there, the more scrap you're going to create. Also, we have to keep in mind with the presentations that we've had this morning and probably what we're going to have later on this afternoon. And now, looking at that statement there with a great degree of pride, castings are not lumps of zinc, aluminium, magnesium, steel, whatever you cast it. They are precision engineered components. The quicker we can get to a finished component, frankly speaking, the more money you're going to make. So that's what you have to keep in mind. Quality is often something that's hidden away, like we discussed this morning with Professor Campbell. It's hidden away, it's in the density of the metal, it's in the way you're handling the metal. Your customer doesn't really understand it, he's not going to get involved in that discussion, he expects a good product. But if anybody knows a customer who's willing to pay for bad products, please let me know and I'll sell him some stuff, believe me. The cost of quality is something that's actually often disregarded when people are making castings. Everybody knows it's there, everybody's trying to fix it, but they don't really know the total cost of it. So let's keep it in simple facts. If it's wrong, it's scrap. So you lose your profit, you lose the opportunity of selling it in the first place, and more often than not, you're gonna to have to make it again. So that's two lots of machine time, two lots of manpower, two lots of energy costs, two lots of melt losses, just double your cost and you've probably figured it out. And you've probably figured out you've lost money on every single one you've sold. So, quality is key to everything you're doing. So, we are lucky enough in the sense that we have an injection molding division. And roughly 60-65% of every tool they use is a hot tip tool. So those of, the, of you in the room who know anything about injection molding, it's quite common. People have been trying for years to try and get it into die casting. Not only with zinc, but also with magnesium. I know people are already doing it. What's happened is nobody's actually ever done it in the UK before until last year when we did it. I don't know any other zinc die caster in the UK that is successfully doing it. I don't even know anybody who's tried it frankly speaking. Okay, the benefits, frankly speaking I could stand here for an hour telling you the benefits. It gives me the opportunity of several injection points which gives me multi-impression tool quite easily. It gives me a very high yield, literally no waste. I show you in a component in a second where there is literally no waste. Because there's less metal going into the die, no runner system, there's less turbulence, so I get better quality. I also get a faster cycle time. Less metal means less cooling time, means a quicker cycle time, means more machine avail availability, means I don't have to buy another die casting machine, I just use the same time, the same machine to fill that time up again. So, in basic terms, that's what we were thinking of trying to get to. The bottom one is probably an important one, 
in the sense that uh, I used to sell die casting machines and they are very, uh, let's say, complicated these days. It's the same in aluminium. You talked about process parameters and so on and setting sheets. These, these are complicated machines to set. It is a skill, believe me. And if we can take away some of that complicated area and put it into technology in the die, it actually makes life a lot simpler. It means I don't need a highly skilled setting operator to make sure I get good quality. It's the tool that's controlling the quality. So the bottom point on there actually is something that probably needs going in, into a little bit deeper. Uh, and certainly my old friends at Freck would be a little bit nervous about it because their very expensive machines are only expensive because of the machine technology. If I don't need that machine technology, then the machine becomes a lot simpler, a lot cheaper, and a lot more readily available. To give you some examples, the pictures on the right are more important to look at. I can, at the moment, with a standard zinc die testing tool, I will have one injection point, which is here. That's the way the machine lets the machine the machine lets the metal go and it enters the die. So all that material there is waste. If I have the ability to distribute from there to keep molten around here, I can actually have, in some cases, up to 16. I've seen one tool with 16 injection points, producing 16 single parts with direct injection. That's the benefit in simple terms. More complicated terms, in the sense of our tool, this is probably what I want to show you most because this is a considerable cost for us. This is a standard core that we're using at the moment. It's very thin, very flimsy, gives me about 50 to 60,000 shots before I have to throw away <coughs> and make a new one or I have to repair it. This is the one out of the hot tip tool which has full temperature control in it. I have a water cooling directly onto it now. That core, probably not that particular one, I have now got to 300,000 shots without changing a core. If I tell you they're about 500 pounds each, that's three times a life. That's a hell of a lot of a saving over several million components. If I add to that the fact that I haven't got metal flowing through the die with the runner, it allows me to put a lot more temperature control into the tool itself, through the cavities, around the bolster, etc. I've not got uh, interference with runner systems, etc. So the injection points that you see on the diagrams actually give me the ability to be a lot more flexible with the tool design. To show you exactly what I'm talking about, the picture on the left was a single cavity tool with a sprue and runner and was changed to a two-point injection to give him the quality, directly injected onto the component, simply no waste. You will also notice that the overflow, the vent on the casting has also been removed. Because there's no runner, there's less air going into the system, he doesn't need the runner anymore. So he's got two wins. The one on the right hand side is a four cavity tool, standard arrangement with a screw in the center. <coughs> Happily made, changed it to a four injection point tool, four single injection points directly onto the component. Again, doesn't need a runner, doesn't need an overflow because the quality is a given. Much, be much better cycle time, much less remelt, much better production method. Coming to ours, and the one I've got in my hand, that's the tool. Standard hot runner system from the plastics, it's the nozzles that are different. The nozzles are a different material. Um, for the guy from Ireland, just for his knowledge, I know with a little bit of tweak of the material, I could also put aluminium through that tool. Already in use with zinc, successfully. Already in use with magnesium, successfully. And I think the machines have to change a little bit, but I'm confident, let's say optimistic rather than confident, that in the next 10 years 
you'll be able to use the same system to die cast small aluminium parts. The controller is very simple. The die casting machine control literally becomes irrelevant because I'm really just pumping metal into a die, that's it. And that's, it's that much metal, it's basically the, the part weight times the number of cavities, that's all I'm pumping in there. I don't need a fast phase or a slow phase or a breaking phase or anything like that. I'm literally just putting the metal in as fast as I can get it in there. The control for the nozzle tip itself is literally just a temperature controller. If I turn the temperature down by 5 degrees, the nozzle switches off. <clears throat> if I turn it back up by 5 degrees, the nozzle turns back on. So I can actually control individual injection points in the tool by simply changing the temperature. So the operator is literally the guy who can control the whole settings of the machine. The rest of it is just opening and closing movements of the die casting machine. The parts that came out on the right hand side is the ones I've got in my hand. And what we chose to do was uh, gate it from the side. I think it's on the next slide. Oh, that's the, the, the cool cause. If you notice, these are the injection points here. And we have two choices. As I explained on the previous slide, I can go directly onto the component. But remember, I've got a core going inside each and every component. So we chose to actually gate from the side to go around the core rather than directly on it to protect it a little bit, that's all. We have built another tool to do it directly. And the injection point that you see on these photos could actually be directly onto the components. Forget this little widget on the top, that's just for separating the parts and we cast the parts. So, the tool we made was actually a four impression tool. Maybe not. Okay. Four impression, two drops. Remember the cycle time for this is roughly 10 seconds. I'm going to show you a video in a second. We made a four impression tool with two hot drops. That tool now runs at less than five seconds. So literally twice as fast. Now okay, I've only got four cavities instead of eight, but it, would be, it wouldn't really be detrimental to the cycle time to put another two cavities in there. I just need a, a bigger bolster area, that's all. And I still maintain I'd get a cycle time of around five, five and a half seconds. The important point I came to before is this section here. We talked about quality before. The air content in the components, honestly speaking, with our normal measurement methods, I can't find it. I have to CT scan the components to find the air. Normally we get around 3% porosity from a conventional die casting tool. I'm now down at less than 1% using this method. So I'm getting parts faster and I'm getting them in higher quality at a reduced cost. <coughs> The actual injection process, as already explained, is simply press a button and fire the metal in. I don't have to mess around with velocities and speeds to a certain extent. I get good parts within a certain range of speeds and pressures. I'm not really complicating the injection profile because I don't need it. I'm just pumping metal into a tool. This is the other tool with the direction inject, direct injection point directly onto the part. We can't actually do it with these components because they are handled when in use. So the actual customer, our sister company, won't allow us to do that. But if you imagine a component that's going onto a wall, a bracket for example, there's no reason why I can't put an injection point on the hidden face. I'd get better parts and I'd get them quicker. As you can see, the integrity, the density of the parts, I really can't find the air. I've, I've sectioned literally hundreds of those things and I can't find the air. So, um, in terms of quality, you're not going to get them any better than that. It's as simple as that. Okay, just to prove to you what I'm talking about, 
<coughs> Hopefully this works. Yeah. That's actually the four impression tool in action. That was literally the first sampling one. Fast come down, down a shim, up a conveyor, and then get separated, fibro finished, and they're done. So I'm getting better parts, twice as fast, at a much reduced cost. Okay, at this point I was actually going to put another slide in uh, showing you a summary of the benefits in percentage terms. And I did start calculating it, but I kept ending up at the same number, so I didn't see much point, frankly speaking. If I always tell you 40%, that's the answer to every question you're going to ask me. I get the parts roughly 40% quicker over an average on, uh, across a, a range of parts. The energy consumption from the machine, measured directly, is roughly 40% uh, less than what it was before. And the quality I can't measure, uh, but I, I actually think it's probably been more than 40%. The only downside to the system is actually the investment cost in the tooling. The tooling is more expensive. Roughly, in the case of this product, about 20%. If I build that into the actual cost of the product and amortize it over its lifetime of let's say a million shots, which I'm quite confident I'm going to get at least, I still get a cost benefit of around 20%. So in cost terms, I'm going to produce 10 million components in the case of the GP small, the one I have here, and I'm going to pr produce them 20% cheaper than I did the year before. What I don't want you to do is tell the people we're selling them to. Okay. And with that, does anybody have any questions? But so are you still making these on a conventional on challenge machine? Yes. Yeah. No changes in the machine. Same boots make. The same boots make, the same machine. Uh, in actual fact, I probably don't need such a complicated machine anymore. It's as simple as that. Maybe the other question was, by taking the other system off, you've reduced the amount of air, mm -hmm. so you don't need the, the vent on the back. Mm -hmm. but you've still got the air in the canister. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's happened to that? Remember, we've got slides top and bottom, oh. so the air will actually escape. That, that bit of air comes out the other Yeah. You, you are going to compress air quite a lot uh, in the system. <coughs> with, with the, it's a little bit different to, to aluminium, and it doesn't shrink so much. Uh, but in the case of these, we always actually, we don't generally use overflows on these components anyway, because you get a lot of air escaping by the slides. And um, what's the length of the hot sprue? The hot tip, um, the one, the only one we changed so far has done about 400,000 shots. So in the case of that, it made me 800,000 bucks. And does the tip of it remain liquid? And the dye opens and it is what's called an aqueous gate, yeah. But basically, you have a, um, it's patented technology, unfortunately, by a German guy, not me. Uh, it's basically two tubes, and it's the temper dif temperature differential between the two tubes that's turning the metal on and off. I'm not answering any questions from you, so. <laughs> How do you decide these are the if you simulate it, if you had it inside the technique? We, we did simulate, thanks to these guys down here. Um, you can simulate just literally the cavity fill uh, and what we were afraid of. Uh, frankly speaking, it works. I am sure we could sell the product with a direct injection method. The only point is that it, you do leave a gate scar on the product and when they're in use, you're, you're actually touching it. So from a, an aesthetics point of view, we didn't do it. And from a, let's say, a, a physics engineering point of view, what we were afraid of was actually creating a hotspot onto the core directly with the injection point. So the way we make the parts now, we feed it from the side. So we've not actually changed the 
component um, to avoid any these are load bearing remember we decided to just stick with what we know and what works rather than changing it simple as that does size become an issue of making something the more volume of metal build diameter can you go up scale yes you can the only the only downside is when you have two injection points you will have a weld point at some point but we haven't encountered anything yet so we will simulate that though Okay, so that's the end of the questions. Uh, thank you, Calvin. Um, got a speaker's gift here for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the